Uh, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. Let me make sure I know how to use this thing. Okay. Uh, I'm Jim. Let me tell you quickly what Irreducible does. So we're a cryptographic acceleration company focused on verifiable computing. Um, that means we're trying to make the world's fastest proving cluster and technology using a combination of algorithmic innovations and hardware acceleration. We use FPGAs, so we design custom digital logic circuits and run FPGA accelerated servers. And since this is available to us, it has opened up the design space of what makes sense algorithmically to use. I want to give one motivating example of hardware software co-design from the world of AI. So uh, modern AI runs on GPUs and also tensor processing units. The TPU, the first generation TPU from Google, uh, did not include floating point multipliers, which are common in the models. Instead, it only includes 8-bit integer multipliers because they can fit, I think, 20, 25 uh, times more int 8 multipliers. And that means that the algorithms had to adjust to use 8-bit quantization for inference. So this is an example of hardware capabilities feeding into the algorithm, and I am going to show another example of that today. Um, briefly, uh, this is gonna be a little more engineering focused of a talk. It's really amazing where we are in the world of verifiable computing and zero knowledge. We have very practical virtual machines that emulate RISC-V at hundreds of kilohertz uh, emulated clock frequency on standard servers. Recursion is extremely efficient and you can build sophisticated architectures using multiple layers of recursive proving today. Uh, it has become really fast using many techniques that we've heard about earlier, including GKR and arithmetization oriented hash functions and lookup arguments. But I really want to uh, emphasize the idea of small field hash based snarks and starks. And that has really unleashed great performance on CPUs and available hardware. What does this mean? For soundness, typically uh, these algorithms are defined over cryptographically large fields, meaning your soundness error is inversely proportional to the size of your field. And so it looks like you would have to use a 256 bit or maybe 128 bit field. But it was recognized that we can instead operate over a smaller field, say 32 bits, and then draw verifier randomness from an extension field. And we actually save a lot by doing this because a lot of the computation, even though it's logically over an extension field, can still be done over a small field. There is a limitation to this, though, if we're using Fry-based techniques which, and Starks, which is that we actually need a large enough evaluation domain for two purposes. Uh, one is read Solomon codes require that the field that you're using is at least as large as the code word size. And also in Starks, the way that you prove uh, the vanishing argument, which I'm going to talk about in a second, requires that you evaluate a polynomial at many, many points. And so it sort of limits us to uh, we can't make our field size much smaller than 32 bits for practical problem sizes. Um, and so small field techniques are so efficient that many companies in the space have, have adopted them, including this is the technology behind Stu um, and, and so on. And so I want to quickly talk about the performance of SNARKs. Uh, so there's kind of four, to oversimplify, there's four steps that we care about. There's witness generation, which is very fast, but a little tricky to paralyze. It's, it's kind of inherently sequential. You have to commit your polynomial witnesses, and this looks like error correcting codes plus Merkle tree building. Uh, there's a vanishing argument, which uh, for all intents and purposes, there's two choices. You can use quotienting of univariate polynomials or the multivariate sum check protocol. And the opening proof, which is kind of where the crypto magic happens, but it's not generally a huge um, contributor to, to time overall because of batching. So if we look at a leading Stark implementation called Funky 3 uh, and we compare and we just look at its performance to prove 4,096 Ketchak F permutations, which is enough Ketchak permutations to hash about a megabyte of data um, on a single thread on a CPU, it's less than a minute using SHA-2 for your Merkle tree. 
Um, and it's much slower using Poseidon 2, which is an arithmetization friendly hash function. Um, but we can see that in both cases, committing takes either a substantial amount of time or the vast majority of the time. Committing is really slow. Um, and part of that is because Poseidon 2 is like 30 times slower than SHA-2 on, on the CPU that I benchmarked. Um, so to understand this, we should look at the arithmetization. And the main thing to point out is that because we had to use a 32-bit field, even though most of our witness values were only the values 0 or 1, we had to pad them up to a full 32-bit field element and we're basically paying a 32x overhead for all of those wires in our circuit. This is basically a 32x loss of efficiency right out the gate because of the limitations that I said using Reed-Solomon codes for error correction and, um, and the univariate quotienting argument for vanishing. So at Irreducible, we wanted to ask, why can't we move to even smaller fields which we call tiny fields, smaller than 32 bits, or even the smallest finite field, F2, which is a finite field with the values zero and one. It's the simplest binary field uh, without paying what we call embedding overhead. So the natural way to do this would be to take a circuit over F2 and embed it into a say 32 bit binary field um, and then use techniques uh, that have already been known the original Fry paper Worked over, works over binary fields. The original Stark paper works over binary fields as well, but we want to do this without embedding overhead. Quick primer on binary fields. I'm not going to go through it all, but they have some really remarkable properties. Addition of binary fields is simply bitwise XOR, um, and multiplication, unlike integer addition, is, is carryless, meaning there's a lot more parallelism in how you multiply binary field elements uh, and the depth of the circuit that is required in hardware to multiply binary field elements can be much, much lower than the depth of a circuit to do integer multiplication. Um, this is kind of natural if you think about multiplying integers from grade school where you have to propagate your carry, you have to keep track of your carries the whole computation. Um, another nice thing about binary fields is they fit perfectly within k bits, or a k bit binary field fits perfectly within k bits. And so we can have binary field data types that match sort of the native data types of, of CPUs, like bytes and bits and words and so on. We use a specific type of binary field too, uh, which is a full extension tower, meaning we can have a sequence of binary fields that nest within one another. So to kind of show how this looks, we can take a string of 128 bits and interpret it as an element of a 128 bit binary field, but we can also interpret it as a vector of four 32 bit field elements or 16 8 bit field elements or uh, 128 F2 elements, and they all nest very nicely within each other. Moreover, the asymptotics of doing multiplications on this particular tower structure is really good. Um, we can use Karatsubo-like techniques to get uh, you know, sub-quadratic sub multiplication complexity um, because we have all these nestings of subfields. Multiplication of a larger field element by a smaller subfield element is very fast. Um, remarkably, even inversion, which is typically very expensive in finite fields, is really fast in these types of finite fields. Um, and so that brings us to Binius, which is a project and a SNARK library that we're developing based on uh, many different techniques, some of which we've developed ourselves that I'll be talking about. Um, but to say the highlights, Binius is a SNARK using multilinear polynomial IOPs based on Hyperplonk. And we have a new type of polynomial commitment scheme where we can commit without embedding overhead uh, we use lookups and uh, to help with arithmetization of, of natural computations inside of binary field circuits. And we use this full tower so that we can, in our arithmetization, have binary field data types that perfectly match the sizes of the data types of nat natural computations. One point about why we do multilinear polynomial IOPs, as I said, uh, there's a problem with using the quotienting based vanishing argument for like that Starks use for tiny fields, but 
using a sum check based zero check, we can uh, validate all of our constraints over tiny fields as well. So this is really important for us. Um, we have published three papers uh, that this, this work is based on. The first generalizes uh, the proximity tests that we heard about earlier to a multilinear setting um, or creates a new type of proximity result that's compatible with multilinear protocols. And I'm gonna be speaking about some techniques from the latest paper, polylogarithmic proofs over multi, for multilinears over binary towers today. So how do we do polynomial commitments uh, without embedding overhead for tiny fields. So first I'm gonna talk about how to commit a large field using uh, a large polynomials over large binary fields. Uh, this is based on a lot of work that we've already heard about. We use the Fry protocol, uh, which is amazing. And it actually, a little known fact, or uh, it works over binary fields and it was originally described uh, as a protocol for binary fields. The basefold paper, which is recent, describes a way to construct a multilinear polynomial commitment scheme using the Fry proximity test, uh, which is not extremely obvious, and it's a very clever idea that I'll talk about in a second. And we use a uh, efficient algorithm for encoding Reed Solomon codes over binary fields uh, based on this LCH paper. Uh, which gives the order of n log n complexity. So how does this look? Well, we start with a polynomial with uh, in what we call multilinear Lagrange basis. So you have its values of a multilinear over the Boolean hypercube. And you do a weird thing where you take those coefficients and treat them as the coefficients of a univariate polynomial. So these are two very different polynomials, but they share coefficients and they have different polynomial bases. Uh, well, in Lagrange basis, the values are the coefficients. And then you turn them into the coefficients of a polynomial, um, actually, uh, in our case, in novel polynomial basis. But if this was over uh, prime fields, it would be you know, normal standard monomial polynomial basis. And the, the whole idea is we're going to run Fry. We're going to encode this polynomial with a Reed Solomon code. We're going to run the multi round Fry protocol where the prover uh, commits the oracle and sends it to the verifier. But in parallel, we're going to interleave a execution of the multivariate sum check protocol at the same time. So with every oracle, you're also gonna send uh, the sum check message, which I'm not gonna describe how the sum check protocol works, but it's uh, when you run these in parallel and share verifier randomness, this gives you a very elegant multilinear polynomial equipment scheme for large binary fields. I guess, a sequence of, uh, of what, bits, two to the L bits? Yes. Uh, sorry, in this case, this is over uh, the F2 to the 128. These are, this is not for tiny polynomials yet. And then you, okay, because you, the, the exponent is like the binary, the binary expansion is converted into the exponent. The binary expansion. Into the index. Into the index. Yes. Well, sorry. So you have, in this case, two to the L coefficients, which are each F2 to the 128 elements. And you. The flattening just views them as. It, it just the views them as a univariate polynomial, correct? Okay, this is an idea essentially from basefold. In our work, we adapt it to the binary field setting. There are some very nice binary field tricks that we need to use. We need to appropriately define the two to the one maps, which um, was mentioned in some earlier talks. And uh, sort of remarkably, we recover a connection to the LCH uh, in paper that uh, is not how that original protocol was described, but actually ends up being Fry compatible if you look at it the right way. Um, okay, 
So what does it mean to commit without embedding overhead? So if we were to take that protocol and sort of do the naive thing where instead we want to commit a polynomial with F2 coefficients instead of F2 to the 128 coefficients, what you would normally do is you would embed, meaning you would pad them up to 128-bit field elements, and you would have this big expansion of your data, and then you could run the protocol, and that would work. Instead, we want to pack them into field elements, which is um, an idea that's kind of inspired by concatenated codes from, from coding theory. Um, and what you can see is if we start with, uh, say, 2 to the L coefficients, we're going to end up, and we, we pack 128 bits, which is 2 to the 7 bits, we'll end up with sort of a multi-linear polynomial in seven fewer variables. If we were to just take those bits and um, we, we could have a, a multilinear polynomial in seven fewer variables. The problem is when we want to evaluate this thing, we started out with, let's say, um, 20 variables, and now we have a polynomial with 13 variables. So it feels like there's some information loss. Like there's how, what would it mean to evaluate our packed polynomial somewhere and learn anything useful about the evaluation of the original? Um, so we need to be more clever than just sort of running fry over this packed polynomial. And the way we do this is we use a mathematical object called a tensor product of fields, which is uh, a little bit of a weird thing, but I'm gonna start describe some of its properties. You can think of it as a two-dimensional array. So in this picture to the right, we'll think of kappa as being seven. So we're packed like it's a, 128 by 128 matrix of bits. We can think of uh, two injections from our 128 bit binary field into this, uh, two separate injections. One lays out field elements vertically and one lays them out horizontally. And we can think of this as a vertical and a horizontal subfield. And the reason we do this, we find that this is really captures the notion of packing because we can think of our packed code word symbols as living in one field, the horizontal subfield, and our verifier challenges as coming from the vertical subfield. And the idea is we have a protocol which is really just a sum check reduction that's going to allow us to reduce the problem of polynomial commitments for tiny field elements to the problem of polynomial commitments for larger uh, for multilinears over larger field elements, but where this sum check is not over fields, it's actually over this uh, tensor algebra structure. Okay, so here's a couple of equations that I will try to uh, uh, explain what's going on. So this is just the standard definition of the multilinear extension, meaning uh, we have F, which is a multilinear in new variables, and we uh, know that it is equal to the sum over the hypercube of the EQ indicator polynomial, which is the multilinear extension of the polynomial where uh, the, if the first new variables are equal to the second uh, times F at that, um, at that vertex. And this is uh, true for fields. And here we're gonna basically define what, what it means to have the packed polynomial. So we're gonna call F hat the packed version of, uh, of F where these betas are the basis of the field extension over the subfield. And we're basically taking a linear combination over each subcube of the values on that subcube and the basis elements. Now, as I said, we're gonna pack we need to figure out if we're laying things out horizontally or vertically. So we're gonna pack our coefficients horizontally, meaning we're taking the uh, mapping of these field elements into the horizontal subring. And so our F hat starts at, or is a polynomial with basically tensor algebra elements, coefficients, but living in the horizontal subfield. And here is sort of the, the key idea, which is if we want to evaluate F hat at a point where the values come from the vertical subfield, we can run this sum check protocol. So we're gonna run a sum check over uh, this equation to the right, where F hat again is uh, coming from the horizontal subfield. Our EQ indicator has coefficients coming from the vertical subfield. And 
Crucially, the verifier challenges that are drawn during the sum check protocol come from the horizontal subfield. And what that means is at the end of a sum check, what do you have to do? You have to evaluate F hat at a particular point determined by the sequence of verifier challenges, and you have to evaluate EQ at a particular point determined by the verifier challenges. And since F hat has both horizontal coefficients and a horizontal evaluation point, this uh, can reduce to a Fry multilinear PCS over F2 to the 128. Uh, if we have questions about this, I'll, we can get back. Yep. So all of the verifier challenges are drawn from the 128-bit field. They're not fully random tensor algebra elements. And the way the soundness argument works is you observe that multiplying an algebra element by a subfield element is basically parallel um, field multiplications. And so you can just sort of extend the Schwarzschild lemma uh, in, in that way. Um, Uh, in fact, it's, it's kind of an interesting observation that even though tensor algebra multiplication of full elements is, is defined by the mathematical structure, in the protocol indication, you're only ever doing field times tensor algebra scaling operations. So it's actually really efficient to implement. So to kind of summarize what's going to happen here, if we're going to commit F2 multilinears with Fry, the prover commits an L variant uh, F2 multilinear by taking its packed L prime variant version, which is a uh, polynomial in fewer variables, 128, uh, a factor of 128 fewer coefficients. And then during the evaluation phase, the prover and verifier uh, engage in an L prime round interleaved uh, sum, uh, sum check with the Fry IOPP, where Fry is just running over a normal field. And what we observe is that even though the prover messages in our sum check it, defined as I have here are a little larger, the Fry, pr Fry protocol dominates the proof size. So overall, this is giving us really a lot of savings in, in proof size and the prover cost is um, very comparable to running uh, like the, the protocols over the, the fields natively. Um, at the very end, the verifier has validated the sum check and has a basically a tensor algebra element, which is 128 by 128 bit matrix. And it's just gonna do a single folding operation over the rows and validate the, the original claim. How does this perform on, on a CPU? Well, uh, for if we're committing 32 bit field elements compared to a regular fry over Plonky three, we're uh, a little bit slower by a factor of say two or three. I think this is something that we'll be able to close the gap on with better implementation. But the real uh, interesting result is that we can commit one bit field elements 10 times faster than Plonky three can because there's no way to get savings with the Plonky three protocol uh, of, of committing small field elements. Um, I have a couple minutes left, so I wanna, oh. Take uh, other bits and we'll encode them as a summation and I times two to the i. Um, well, I think that's that's basically it. Um, I'm not sure if there's a better way to unpack while you consume them than than what I'm aware of. But like, kind of going back to the beginning of the talk, the Plonky three Ketchak arithmetization has a trace defined over one bit values, and so yeah. Um, our current performance results uh, basically show that the time to commit has essentially disappeared. Um, in fact, our witness generation time is faster too because we can do clever binary field to integer bit casting tricks, but we're just left with the, run the cost of running the vanishing argument, which is the sum check protocol. And I'm gonna say at the end of this presentation how we're gonna get rid of that as well. But um, we are, already faster than Plonky3 running with a fast hash function. Uh, another thing that I didn't mention is we are using a binary field friendly hash function, which is uh, Grostel. It's sort of based on the design of AES. And I, I will note that the original Stark paper had a very 
similar idea to use a AES based hash, um, noting that it would be arithmetization friendly for binary fields, which is why we've chosen Grostel. Um, and as I said at the beginning, we are looking at everything from a hardware efficiency point of view. So I wanna give some numbers on how binary field arithmetics compare to uh, prime field arithmetics. So this is some of our FPGA prototypes for uh, prime fields. So we can look at the number of gates it takes to uh, have a multiplier circuit and the maximum clock frequency that these can run at and basically take, uh, find an area times delay product, which is sort of the number of operation or uh, number of operations you can do per logic gate. And we basically see that comparing the Mersenne 31 bit field to a 32 bit binary field were about five times more efficient in this metric of uh, area times delay. And in this, uh, we've also shown the uh, cost of doing 128 bit binary field multiplications, which becomes relevant in the sum check protocol. Um, and it's really efficient there too. Um, I also wanted to compare to BN254 scalar field, which is uh, many, many more gates, logic gates required. And also it requires 49 pipeline cycles in hardware, which has overhead. Whereas we can do an entire 128 bit multiplication in a single clock cycle because the depth of the multiplier circuit is so low. Um, I'm about out of time. So I wanna skip the other FPGA numbers and go to uh, our ongoing work. And the number one uh, thing that we still need to implement is small field optimizations for sum check, which is how can we run the sum check protocol more efficiently over small fields? That's something we know how to do uh, from a research point of view and are working on a CPU implementation of. Uh, we also recently came out with this protocol that I've described today and are doing batching optimizations for it. Um, we're working on a recursive prover using Binius uh, better arithmetization and a more friendly way of writing constraint sy systems with the Binius library. Um, so we have a code repo that you can follow along. Binius.xyz will re redirect there. And uh, thank you very much. Questions? So, so is it the, like, what do you do with the um, GPUs or I, do they, is it still the case or maybe now they like, uh, they, they have ways to? We have done a little bit of research into GPUs. Um, they're not very good at binary fields. That's our conclusion. I will say that um, the way tower field multiplication works is different from multiplication of binary fields with say a uh, modulo and uh, irreducible univariate polynomial. So there are some better bit twiddling tricks than you can do that you can do than binary convolution, but um, we have prototyped this and it's just, the NTT complexity gets comparable because that ends up being memory bottlenecked at a certain size, but just field th multiplication throughputs pretty, pretty poor. Um, but basically the story is that the efficiency is completely reversed in a native circuit. And we've also analyzed the cost if you were to build an ASIC of, uh, you know, integer multiplication versus binary field multiplication. Uh, I see that you plan to integrate or you have already integrated this with a lookup argument. Do you have any numbers on uh, like what speed up you get by using this commitment scheme? Um, oh, uh, well, we, we have implemented the lasso lookup argument um, and its adaptation to binary fields. Um, and we've also, and, and that uses GKR sort of under the hood. Um, we are working now on comparing some of our circuit arithmetization to kind of a naive version as well as a lookup based version. And I don't have numbers off the top of my head yet, but we can chat offline. Thank you.